Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jared Porjita, and I work for USNC Power, so that is the Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation. And I am presenting on our in house analysis software. So, this is a structural analysis of irradiated core graphite components and then its further integration into ANSYS. So, just a quick overview. Uh, first, I'm going to be speaking about our background as a company and exactly what we're doing, and then why we actually have graphite in our cores and you know what its purpose is. Then I'll move on to our analysis framework, which is uh, a nuclear graphite interactive material model and simulation environment model. Then I'm going to show you how exactly it uh, uses the inputs to get the stress and deformation results that we are getting and why they are so different to what your typical stress strain results would look like for other materials. Then I'm going to uh, give a brief breakdown of you know, the plans for the future, how we are going to work further to get uh, more integration into ANSYS, specifically into the workbench environment, so we can make this as smooth as possible, and then give some concluding remarks. Uh, so just some of our background, uh, USNC was founded back in 2011 as a spin-off of a Department of Energy and uh, Labs and a, the Deep Burn program. So the result of that was pretty much our fuel, so which is fully ceramic microencapsulated fuel, which I'll discuss a bit later. We are a fully privately funded US company. Um, we are based in Seattle, but we have offices everywhere. And uh, I think every morning I wake up when we have a new person added to the group chat. So currently we have offices in uh, Seattle. We've got one in Ottawa in Canada. We've got one in Korea and South Africa and France and Poland. Uh, they are popping up everywhere. And I have 100 plus people in six countries now, but I think we're up to 150 at the moment. So I'll have to update these slides at some stage. Um, so the purpose of the company is to uh, pretty much, you know, create a new technology, something that hasn't been done before really. And the base of that is our fuel. So it is uh, nuclear reactor fuel, uranium, uh, a form of it that is kept inside a ceramic uh, matrix made of silicon carbide that prevents it from melting down. It has an extremely high melting temperature, is very, very strong, and doesn't let any of the fission products uh, escape from it. That uh, ceramic fuel goes into our micromodular reactor, which uh, you can see on the right there. Uh, so the whole purpose of this reactor is that it is a standalone system that you can put anywhere in the world, basically, and leave it unoperated and uh, you will not have to do pretty much any maintenance, so every couple of years, but uh, significantly less, and it will not be refueled for its 20 year lifetime. Uh, in addition to our micromodular reactors, we also have a space site called USNT Tech, who are working on nuclear thermal propulsion, um, but they are mostly centered in the US. Uh, so we do have a, a construction project underway. We have a site located in Chalk River in Canada, and the licensing process is on the way. We have already submitted our first and second applications, the, the VDR submissions to the Canadian uh, regulator, and those have gone well so far. So our system consists of two major uh, sectors. So the nuclear plant is something that we are trying to modularize as much as possible so that we can put 10 identical plants that have been created in a factory and shipped to site and in installed within a couple of months. And then we'll have an adjacent side as well, which can be uh, altered depending on the client's needs to make electricity or process heat, hydrogen production can be used for agriculture. And uh, one of the great benefits of this is that we use a secondary coolant, which is molten salt that can be stored in molten salt tanks that so we can vary our power outputs which is a pretty serious downside of nuclear. It's usually either you're going full speed or you're shut down. And now we can vary it throughout the day to make sure that during the high power uh, requirement times, we can get the output, but then during the nights, uh, we can slow it down and store it up more for the next day. So why is graphite used in a reactor cores? Well, its main purpose is that it's a neutron moderator. So when neutrons come out of fissioned uranium atoms, they are going very, very fast and pretty much just pass through whatever they hit without interacting in it, besides carbon and hydrogen. So we need to have carbon or hydrogen in the core to slow down those neutrons so that when they do interact with other uranium atoms, they are slow enough 
to actually uh, bond to the molecule or atom and cause a fission. In addition to that, it has great mechanical properties. I mean, its strength is really, really high at extremely high temperatures, which is where we're planning on operating, and it has a very high conductivity as well, up to 130 watts per meter Kelvin, you know, at room temperature. And it's inert, it sits in our core and it essentially does nothing. It just holds our fuel, provides access for us to put absorbers in to control the fission reactions. And then during shutdown cases, if we have lost coolant or um, if there's been um, any form of stop to our primary coolant system, it allows for passive heat removal through conduction and radiation to the outsides of the vessel. Now, even though it is a, its properties are very good for its application, unfortunately there are some downsides, which is that neutron irradiation changes graphite's form at a atomic structure, pretty much, in the atomic lattice. So graphite is quite a porous ceramic, and because we can't really estimate the size or nature of these pores, there are always going to be some small inclusions, which mean that the material can fail at a much lower stress than the average failure strength of the material in general, which needs to be accounted for. Um, in addition, so the irradiation changes the strength, the conductivity, the coefficient of thermal expansion, the dynamic Young modulus, uh, it causes its own form of creep. So the graphite doesn't get hot enough for thermal creep, but a radiation creep happens. And the graphite actually changes shape because the uh, neutrons displace atoms within the lattice and it causes it to shrink throughout life. As you can see in the image on the top right, before eventually growing again, it can actually get bigger than it was at, uh, at the beginning of life. And most of these properties are anisotropic, which means it, it will shrink uh, different rates in different directions. The conductivity is different in different directions, which is dependent on uh, the way that it was formed and the size of the grains. Um, so when we have to model stresses in graphite, it has to take all of these into consideration. The anisotropy, the dimensional change, the radiation induced creep. So that is the primary purpose of this model is that it can uh, solve the stress strain equations with all of these stresses and strains involved. So on the right, you can see that our linear elastic change, we have a primary creep, a secondary creep, a thermal strain and the Wigner strain, which is our radiation induced dimensional change which are all summed together to form our total strain and then therefore our stress. So the last time this model was actually presented at this same presentation, um, or uh, to QFinsoft at least, this was the state of it. So in a separate Python uh, Anaconda notebook at the moment, but it's a Python environment, we would have to take all of our material property data as well as the fluent and temperature data of our core and feed it into a Python environment, which would then create 3D material property curves and write all of the temperature and fluent data into a uh, Fortran file, which would then be compiled using Intel Fortran compiler into a user mat and then passed on to Ansys Mechanical via a DLL, which would then take all of this data and then solve the stress and strain equations uh, inside the DLL before finally passing those stress results back into an Anaconda notebook, which we can use it to calculate the probability of failure of our components. Since then, we have had a decent number of changes. Um, the best one being so far that now we can pass our temperature data uh, straight into Workbench, so through the external data module, which means that now we can use ANSYS's own interpolation model, which uh, I do need to vary still. I'm hoping that there is a user interpolation function because a lot of the data we have is very different in the different directions because of the anisotropy, and being able to vary the direction of the interpolation function uh, would be very, very useful for this application and what it is what our current interpolation model does. So now all we need to pass in is the fluent and the material property data, which gets written into our user mat again. But now we can vary our material property curves uh, through Workbench so, or through Mechanical. We can put our own temperature data in. 
and we can alter that temperature throughout the life through Workbench. So without actually having to run our results again, if we want to simulate a shutdown, we can just turn all the temperatures down to room temperature or we can times them by one and a half to simulate a variety of different scenarios. And then those stress results are still now passed into an Anaconda notebook where they're used to calculate the probability of failure. So the probability of failure isn't straight uh, as straightforward as most other materials where you take the stress and you measure it against your failure criteria. And if it's above it, it fails. If it's not, it doesn't. Because of the porous nature of graphite, we don't know where or when these inclusions are going to occur. So the small pores that just increase the probability of it breaking, which means that the larger the component, the more chances are that there is going to be an inclusion in there somewhere, which means that we have to scale our probability of failure according to how big the components are and how much of the material is under enough stress to cause, this, uh, to cause failure. So what this code does is it takes all of the elements inside our uh, geometry, sorts their stress according to uh, you know smallest to largest, and then has a specific cutold threshold, and then it discards all of the stresses below that, and then it goes and it calculates the probability of fail of of each of those individual elements based on how uh, high their individual stresses are and then takes all of those individual probabilities of failure to find the probability of survival of the entire component. And then you minus that from one to get the probability of failure of each individual component. So just having a look here, this is what a typical core temperature influence data would look like. So this is an entire graphite structure here and the temperature as the fluid comes in, you know, it gets heated up and the more it gets heated up, the higher the temperature of the blocks goes. But we can have the highest fluence points at different locations in the core to where the highest temperature points are. And the stress, both the thermal stress as well as the radiation induced changes are both dependent on fluence and temperature, which means that temperature gradients are probably the ones that are actually going to cause failure because you will have different amounts of irradiation induced changes and very small parts of the block so they can be right next to each other and have one part growing while the other side is shrinking. So just having a look at some very generic results. This is the maximum stress that we get when we have run a single block and the highest stresses typically occur at the beginning of life because they are just thermal stresses and then as the uh, more and more neutrons hit the blocks, uh, the stresses actually creep out and slowly decrease. However, eventually the dimensional change starts to become a major playing factor and the stresses then gradually increase throughout life again. So what you can see here from all of these, the spikes in the stress curves is that we have actually gone and changed our temperatures to uh, from what they, the actual results are to just a flat 300 to simulate what would happen if we did shut down for an extended period of time. And then we can ramp it back up to the normal properties whenever we feel like it to simulate a, however many number of shutdowns we want to throughout life, which was a great addition. One of the complex uh, parts of the code is that uh, the tensile strength of graphite is significantly lower than the compressive strength stress and that's what is most likely to cause failure. So to have actual comparisons between different sets of data, we have to convert our compressive stresses to equivalent tensile stresses so that they can be uh, adequately treated when we are doing a probability of failure codes, which is one of the reasons why all of the stress data has to be exported into a Python file. So next are the ways in which we would like to improve the functionality of the code as well as its integration into ANSYS. So one of the primary uh, factors of this code is how much fluence actually affects it. And while fluence is a property in ANSYS ADPL at the moment and is used as a metric for its own user strain uh, subroutine, uh, Workbench doesn't have a fluence functionality. So we have found ways of patching the fluence in so that you can import it straight into the user mat. 
However, because we want this to become a proper integrated framework that the whole company will use, we want it to be a uh, proper functionality of the software is that we aren't patching over anything because that uh, can easily be missed by someone. So hopefully there is a way soon that we can bring Fluence directly into Workbench. And so that we can have our own uh, well, answers as own interpolation functions and so that we can alter it in the same way we have been altering the temperature so we can scale it uh, when we do run sensitivity studies or when we run uh, a variety of different cases. Uh, another functionality is so far I haven't managed to compile the Fortran code directly out of ANSYS. So we do it externally via in, uh, the Intel compiler, but I'm hoping that there is a functionality that will allow us to directly compile it through ANSYS Mechanical so we can get it to do it itself and script it inside there. Another aspect which would like to be improved on is, as I mentioned, the interpolation techniques. So, so far, the ANSYS ones I have found haven't managed to get the anisotropy of our material correctly. So we know in which direction the cells are stretched or where the data is stretched out. So being able to uh, say, you know, when you do interpolate, take the XY uh, direction, or take the XY direction, take you know, a smaller radius of interpolation, but then in the Z direction, take a significantly larger one. Uh, that would help out a lot, and I think would uh, help, especially with the temperature data. And then some of the lower priority uh, plans we have are to use ANSYS's own uh, user strain subroutine. So, so far, I haven't managed to put our own user strain functions into it especially because we have to solve the creep uh, simultaneously as the strain. However, we could do it in the user creep function that I'm hoping would solve all uh, solve those issues. However, we would need the fluent input, as I mentioned, in the higher priority case. And then lastly, we would like to turn this into an ACT extension so that it can be uh, you know, out in the open and we can have a regulator formally approve it one day. So just some concluding remarks. Um, so this work is a graphite analysis and simulation framework, which was actually developed as a PhD by the late Michael Heinle, and is openly available and free to use for anyone, commercially or academically. And it is on GitHub at the moment with some uh, valid uh, verification cases set up already. And we would love for people to use it and to let us know exactly how they find it and if there can be any improvements. The software can actually be used with any firm package. So there are some open source ones such as Calculate, which you can use, but we are designing it further for specific use with ANSYS Mechanical and specifically through Workbench. Um, so no, no software is ever truly finished. We can always find a way to improve it, and we are putting a significant amount of time into improving it and specifically streamlining it with regards to the temperature and the fluence. Um, and then this software is aimed at design using the ASME boiler and pressure vessel code. So the probability of failure um, results that are given out are directly compared to the uh, limits given for graphite components in the ASME codes, which is what the probability of failures on those previous graphs were. Those were the uh, limits specified by ASME for the various operating conditions. And then lastly, USNC intends to create a regulator qualified version of this code and in ANSYS, and it would be great to have it as an ACT extension. Uh, thank you very much. And if there are any questions, please leave them in the comment box or email me afterwards. Thank you very much.